This is a Saddleback Church podcast. What if I told you that Christianity saved a civilization? Maybe your reaction is something like, well, yeah, that's what we believe about Jesus' work on the cross. And yes, that's true. But what I'm talking about is a little bit different. Throughout history, Christianity has had a major impact on the way a society has thought about every major area of life. To think about what life may be like now if Christianity hadn't hadn't had such profound change on society from the Roman Empire on is hard to fathom. My guest today is Dr. Jim Papandrea, author along with Mike Aquilina of the book, How Christianity Saved Civilization and Must Do So Again. Jim is professor of church history and historical theology. He is on the faculty of the Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary and is a senior fellow at the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology. Jim and I talk about some of the ways in which Christianity revolutionized a civilization throughout history, and then discuss why Christians need to take up the mantle to do so again. My name is Jason Wheeland, and this is a Doable Discipleship, a Saddleback Church podcast, part of the Saddleback family of podcasts. Now, my conversation with Dr. Jim Papandreou. Thank you so much for joining me today. Really appreciate your time for you being here. I'm excited to talk about this with you. Oh, well, this is great. Thanks for inviting me. I'm uh, I'm very happy to be here. So can you start by setting the stage for us, if you will? What led you and Mike to set out to start to research and write about just all of the different ways in which Christianity has changed or revolutionized um, a civilization over the years? Yeah, well, Mike and I met um, at a uh, a speaking uh, conference thing, and um, he, you know, he was kind of like the second speaker, and I just went to hear. And then the next year at that same conference, he was the primary speaker, and I was the second speaker. <laughs> and and um, but, you know, we met in that context. We're both kind of you know historians. We both work with the church fathers a lot, and we became fast friends over things like being Italian, eating <laughs> pasta. And also this idea that the world is moving and has been moving more and more in a kind of full circle back to what what it was like for the early church in the Roman Empire. Mm. And so, um, you know, we, we got to talking about how, you know, what must it have been like for the early Christians in, in an empire that was that was anti-Christian, but also that was just sort of ambivalent to all things Christian. I mean, you know, if you think about the Roman Empire, the Roman Empire was not this peaceful, tolerant place. All of the worst <laughs> sins you can think of were business as usual yeah. uh, for, you know, society in the Roman Empire. Um, for them, religion had nothing to do with morality. Um, men, and especially wealthy men, had unlimited rights virtually, yeah. but then everybody else didn't. And marriage was for convenience. People were expendable. And, you know, the best form of entertainment was public humiliation. And so, you know, this this was the world that the church was born into. And, um, you know, if you were if you were rich and powerful, it was a great place. But for the 99 percent, it was it was a hard life. And um and, and the church was persecuted, as you know. And so now here we are, and we find ourselves in the 21st century, and there's a lot of aspects of Western culture that are becoming more and more like that, mm-hmm. right? Um, we find ourselves, again, as a sort of um, minority in a world that at least looks sideways at us and and in some ways persecutes us, and in some places in the world is, you know— serious persecution. Yeah. Um, and we find ourselves 
having to be countercultural if we're going to be Christian. Mm-hmm. You know, the biggest difference between the early church and us is the early church never knew what it was like to live in a Christian culture, right? But we sort of do. And if you're if you're my age or older, you remember what that was like, where you could you could sort of assume that you know, you can send your kids to school and they're going to absorb Judeo-Christian values and the culture is basically Christian. Yeah, Those days are over. And so, you know, on the one hand, we're mourning the loss of what we thought anyway was a Christian culture. And, you know, don't get me wrong. I know it wasn't perfect and it, you know, it wasn't equal for everybody. <laughs> yeah. But, but I mean, we're coming full circle to, um, to a world where if we want to be Christian, we have to be countercultural. Um, and, you know, and so the very first day that Mike and I met, we got around to talking about these things and we agreed about all of this. Mm. And then we talked about how, well, you know, maybe there are things we can learn from the early Christians and how they dealt with it and how they were a countercultural church in the midst of a, of an anti-Christian empire and then, you know, it was pretty quickly after that that we decided we need to write this book. Wow, that's a, it's a great way to think about it, that it's just started with a conversation around what we see today and talk about and then what we've seen in history. And you can make those parallels so clear. And that's and that's very clear as you read the book. You're reading the book, you're learning about these different ways that Christianity um, changed a civilization's, you know, hundreds, hundreds, hundreds of years ago, and you could see, wait, I, I, I'm confused. Is this talking about history? Is this talking about now? Because it is so, there is, it is so true that those parallels are so strong. So uh, the book covers a number of different ways that civilization was impacted by Christianity. I want to home in on just uh, a few of those for this conversation, and then just ask you to unpack those for us, if you will. So first, if we could talk about the revolution of the person. How how did Christianity change how a person is thought of? Yeah, well, you know, we we are so used to living in a world uh, where we at least at, at least hold up the ideal of all people being created equal, yeah. and it's written into the constitution of our country, and so we think of that as an American idea. But it's only an American idea because first it was a Christian idea. Mm. Um, in the ancient world, in the Roman Empire, no one ever thought that all people were created equal. Um, in fact, in in virtually every culture in the ancient world, the assumption was that you were born into a particular station in life, and that was your station in life. And the 99% exist to serve and entertain the 1% yeah. with, you know, very little chance uh, of moving up the food chain. And so, you know, here comes the church. Now, Judaism gave us this doctrine that everyone is created in the image of God, right? But Christianity took that and evangelized it. I mean, Christianity, the church took that and applied it to humanity in ways that the that the you know the Western world Roman Empire could not ignore, and applied it even to uh, social hierarchies, to the point where and and you know we forget just how radical this is, but to the point where you know at the agape meal in the Eucharistic meal at the Eucharistic table, rich and poor sat next to each other. Yeah, that that's a big deal, and that's part of the reason why the you know the church spread. Um, now, you know, it's it's a, it's a bit of an embarrassing fact that it took until the 3rd century for the church to get around to saying, "Hey, wait a minute, maybe maybe slavery is a bad idea," <laughs> yeah. right? But the church did eventually get around to saying that. Mm. Um and and did eventually almost rid the world of slavery before it came back again. But um you get the point. These ideas about um human rights and the dignity of every human person. These are Christian ideas, and they only exist in our world because the church gave them to our world. Yeah, I think that is such an important thing to remember, right? If there wasn't Christianity, if there wasn't this belief that we were all made in the image of God and ultimately loved by God and seen as the pinnacle of creation, then we're just kind of hapless matter that just kind of 
you know, got made somehow and we live for a certain number of years and then you die and you're just become back up to be a part of the earth. And therefore, and there's no, in, you know, inherent value, in, intrinsic value in that. But it was through what we believe as Christians and say, hey, like you are, you have a mago, you have the image of God imparted in you. God has known you and thought of you and cares about you and loves you in a way that you you know, that, that, that we continue to try to understand is how much God loves us. Right. It's, yeah, it's near yeah, impossible. Right. And when we start to see other people, and if we think about people that way, that can change how societies work, how civilizations work, how culture works, if we truly held on to that. And I just think yeah, that's that's something, right. it's something that's so important to keep in front of us. Yeah. And, you know, we see this again, coming full circle in our culture now where it's fashionable to say that you know um some endangered little tiny fish or frog you know is just as valuable as a human being or uh you know or, or for whatever reason humans don't have any more right to to life or to exist than than animals and you know in actual practice there are people who would like to convince us that humans have have less of a right to life than animals, sure. especially pre-born humans. And so, you know, with, with the, uh, the, you know, the, the push toward, toward, um, you know, more access to abortion, what, what we ultimately have is the diminishing of the value of human life. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I, I, I love that that is one of these revolutions that you focused on in your book, because it is something that we need to Consider the past and, and consider the role that that a Christianity and our faith played even all those years ago, and then say, okay, so what am I doing about that now? Is this still? You know, how is this impacting the way that I think now? And each of these that we're going to talk about, and then at the end we'll do kind of a big discussion around that. Is it's important to always be asking that question: How is this impacting how I live now? Right. So the. Yeah. Set, uh, the second revolution, then, that I'd love for you to talk uh, about here is the home. How how was redefining, or I should say, what was redefining about the way that Christianity looked at the home? Yeah, well, I think there's there's two main aspects to this. And uh, the first is that it has a lot to do with marriage and what marriage is. Uh, in the Roman world, marriage was a business contract. It was a business arrangement meant to consolidate wealth and to make sure that the wrong people didn't inherit the wealth, right? And so, um, you know, you have marriage is a kind of, um, you know, a, a business merger mm -hmm. between families. If you don't have a lot of money, there's, there's really no reason in the Roman world to even have a legally registered marriage. And what, what a lot of people don't understand is in the early church, most Christians probably didn't have a legal marriage under Roman law. Um, they got the blessing of their bishop, and they they lived together, and they formed a family. But you know, they 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 didn't, or sometimes they couldn't, uh, mm. you know, have a legal marriage if it was a marriage between people of different social classes. Um, and uh, you know, under Roman law, if if uh, if a, a man who was the head of a of an extended household found a better business match for his wife he could initiate the divorce or sorry for his daughter mm. he could initiate the divorce of his daughter and son-in-law to then remarry his daughter to someone else who was better for business mm. and so you know the church gave us christianity gave us the idea of uh, monogamous marriage. Actually, Judaism gave us the idea of monogamous marriage. Christianity turned it into a sacrament, to turn it into something by which two people, um, you know, not only make a business arrangement, but but encourage each other's sanctification through through that relationship. Yeah. Um, and so, um, you know, so so marriage and and the family become something sacred, something holy as opposed to, you know, uh, a marriage of convenience. Yeah. And then the, the other aspect of the home is, uh, has to do with the protection of women and children, mm. because, you know, in the Roman world, women are commodities and children are disposable. 
It's just that simple. And, you know, the church really fought against that. And eventually, of course, you know, some of these things took uh, the church becoming legalized in order to, to, uh, you know, to, to make some major changes. But the point is, is that through the church, um, you know, the, the world learned that, you know, women are not meant to be owned by men. Right. Yeah. And, and that children are a blessing and not a, a, not a burden. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, you don't have the right to kill your child, um, you know, for reasons of convenience or whatever. Yeah. And so, um, so, so, you know, one of the things that I always emphasize is that th the church from its very beginning, even from the documents we have from the first century, um, it's very clear that, that the, the church took a very hard, what we would call pro-life stance opposing abortion, because for the Romans, um, they didn't care whether the baby had been born or not. You can kill it before it's born. You can kill it after it's born. Yeah. Didn't matter to them. And uh, for the church, the protection of women and, and children mattered. And um, and then as as children grew up in the Roman world, boys especially were susceptible to um, predatory relationships uh, with older men. Mm -hmm. And the church, of course, uh, opposed that as well. And so, you know, this this idea that the home was a safe place uh, is a very, you know, Christian or Judeo-Christian idea. Yeah. At least in these first two revolutions that we've talked about with the person and with the home, it really sounds like what we're capturing is the way that we think about people, the way that we think about yeah. a, a, about people in general as, as, as their own— a person and the value of personhood. And, and then also, as we see people in r relationships, in this case, in the home, right? It's it's yeah. looking at the way that, that Christianity revolutionized the way that we view our role as parents, our, our, our role as dad or as mom, and our relationship to each other as spouses, our relationships between us and our kids. It seems like like that is is really what this is is boiling down to is that you are called to live in in, in this relationship that you believe as a Christian that like God formed this family for a purpose yeah. and that he has called us to love each other as we love ourselves if we just even just take that verse and just lay it upon these two revolutions it seems like it's just saying hey think about people the way that God thinks about you the way that he wants you to think about each other. <laughs> yeah, no, that's right. That's, that's right. And I mean, the whole thing, it, you know, gets extended from the, you know, the, the very being of God as a Trinity mm -hmm. to then, you know, the, the family and then everything is built on that core uh, of, of re relationships in the family, the church itself treated as a kind of a family and then, you know, the universal church as an extended family. So everything is built with those building blocks right there. I want to uh, dive into for a minute, if you don't mind, a little bit more on the parenting side, because I'm really I'm interested in that. I mean, I have a young parent with three young kids, so I'm a little bit <laughs> I have some invested interest in, the, in that part. Yeah. How uh, how did we see a shift specifically in terms of like the role that a dad or mom played in a kid's life from back in ancient days to then what we seen from Christianity, you know, I teach your child in the way they should go. Children are a blessing, that kind of that shift to where we are now. And then what kind of call do you think that we need to adopt as we move forward into the must do so againness of the book? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, because I wouldn't want to suggest that, you know, pagan Romans didn't love their children. Uh, sure. I, I think they they certainly did. And um, and they certainly valued education, though, for boys more so than for girls. And I yeah. think I think the case could be made that within the church, um, there's more of a sense that girls were valued on, you know, more of an equal level as boys and that uh, that education was um was valued but you know the thing is is that i hinted at this earlier that that uh you know in in the educational system of the roman world and especially for boys 
that could often include these uh, sort of uh, relationships of of boys with older men, mm -hmm. which were sexual relationships. I mean, these were abusive. Yeah. We we would certainly see it this way. These were abusive relationships of uh, a powerful man, um, and in the in the name of mentoring or yeah. or tutoring taking a young boy under his wing and but of course that th this was a sexually predatory relationship and so the church of course resisted this but um but what that meant was and i think maybe this is the point for where we are now in the 21st century is that as much as the church valued education they knew that they couldn't necessarily um trust non-christians to educate their children yeah. And I kind of think we're we're back at that point, mm. right? Where we 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 know education is important, but we are struggling with the reality, depending on where we live in the country or in the world, we're struggling with the reality that we're not sure we can trust um, you know, the educational system. And so of course people have different ways of dealing with that. Sure. Uh homeschooling, private schooling, or just, you know, parents being super involved in in the you know the, the the public schooling of their kids, um, you know, and that's a choice you got to make, you know, for for your kids. But um, it definitely requires being you know somewhat intentional and proactive about it because I don't think we can necessarily just trust the world out there to educate our kids and assume that they're going to get what they need and and be safe. Yeah, I I think the big word that you used is involvement, right? And we can see. But that that is a part of of uh, of us. Our, our our call as as Christians is to be as involved in our kids' lives as possible. God gave us to them, so to be steward of these children that God has given us to raise requires involvement. Back in ancient times, there was a probably I would imagine a lot less involvement. It was a hey, our kids are being raised. I I love my kids. That's great, but. I go and do my thing. They're usually being trained to and do their thing. And, you know, and then eventually they'll take over the family business, depending on what level of status you're in kind of thing. Whereas... Well, it does. Uh, yeah, it, did, it, it would have had a lot to do with how wealthy a person was. And, yeah. you know, then as now, the temptation is the wealthier you are, the more there's a temptation to sort of pay someone else to raise your kids. Um, but yeah, in the ancient world, you know, there was, there was the whole apprenticeship model yeah. where you could take a very young boy or even a girl, depending on the occupation, and sort of hand them off yeah. to, to a stranger at a very young age to go live with that stranger and be brought up to, you know, uh, to, to learn a trade. So, um, so yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Involvement is the key. Involvement is the key. You heard it here. Involvement is the key. <laughs> so, There's lots of keys. That's one of them. <laughs> so the... Last one of the revolutions that I want to touch on today is the revolution of a community. And so, friends, if you're listening, you have to buy the book to read about the revolutions of work and religion and death and the state, all of which are very interesting, very compelling reads in the book. But right now I want to touch on the revolution of community. So how is Christianity's approach to community different than what we've historically thought of. Yeah, well, you know, you you hit the nail on the head earlier when you suggested that it's all about relationships, right? And um, so just like marriage, uh, in the ancient world, uh, your relationship with your neighbor is a kind of a, a contract, maybe a business contract, maybe a social contract, but it's kind of a contract in which um, you are good to the people who can be good back to you, right? Who can reciprocate. But if there's a person in your community who has no ability to do you any favors, then in you know in the the Roman mind you have no obligation to that person, right? Christianity comes along and says, love your neighbor, especially not just even, but especially the ones who can't pay you back. Um, you know, most people don't know this. Most people have this vague sense that uh, the Roman Empire had this thing called the dole, where they gave out free bread, right? But what you don't know, or maybe don't know, is <laughs> that when when the day comes for the for the dole and say, okay, well, you know, we're going to give out free bread, 
the people had to line up by social class mm. with the wealthiest people in the front of the line. So the people who needed the free bread the most were at the back of the line. And if they ran out of free bread, oh, well, right? So that's that's what Roman philanthropy was, <laughs> right? You give to the people who already have, basically. Yeah. Um, but but here comes, you know, the church saying, we have a responsibility to even the stranger. We have a responsibility to um, treat the, the poor in a way that will uh, elevate them to some extent, yeah. um, even those outside the church. And, you know, so again, in the ancient world, you know, your station in life kind of determines what you deserve. But the church rebels against that and says, no, you know, everyone is created in the image of God. So what you deserve is not based on the accident of what social class you were born into. Um, and, and in fact, the early Christians shocked their neighbors by doing things like caring for the sick during a time of plague, when caring for the sick meant you were risking your own life. Mm -hmm. You know how to tell when a plague is coming to your town? When you see the doctor packing up his family and getting out of town, that's that's how you know when the plague yeah. is coming. And yet the Christians risked their own lives to care for the sick. Um, and, you know, this is the kind of thing that that made the church grow. You know, I always say, you know, it wasn't the emperor Constantine that that converted the empire to Christianity. By the time he came along, it was a done deal. It, the 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 Roman Empire was converted to Christianity by Christians loving one neighbor at a time. Mm. That's how it was done, and um, and I think there's a lesson there. If we want to convert our world, it's going to be done by loving one neighbor at a time. Yeah. Um, but that does mean that we have to form relationships with our non-Christian neighbors, which is harder and harder to do in this world especially post covid and everything you know yeah um but we got to get out there and, and build relationships well it's and again the, and this is that important reminder right everything that we're hearing right now is that our society in the united states is going through this epidemic of loneliness is kind of the term that's being used and yeah. it's this idea that there are so many people who are just who are, are saying or are expressing that they have never felt lonely or that they have less connections to other people than they did. And this was even pre-COVID, people were saying this, and then it's just was has been exacerbated since the pandemic. And so it, right. so this this desire, this that this need then this draw to rethink about how Christianity thinks about community is so vital. It's it's that reminder that we that we are we're made by a triune God to be in relationship with others, right? It says it very early in right. Genesis that man should not be alone. And we need to take that to heart that God has, has made us as a family. He's made us to be, in, 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 so for us as believers, it's being part of the family of God. It's being part of that family. But even with non-believers, you're still all image bearers, still all loved by God. So we are called to be together. If you are alone, then you are cut off from the rest of God's goodness through people. And it's just, it, that's, that, that's that hard reality. That's right. That's right. And it's not a matter of just circling the wagons either, because um, then, we, then we would never interact with non-Christians who need to hear exactly. the gospel. So Exactly. I wanted to go back to that idea that you just posed on that on that if we're going to uh, spread the word of Christ to people, it's going to be one person at a time. It, and that's the way they go. Um, Pastor Rick Warren, when he was here at Saddleback, had said had said people don't uh, don't care how much you know until they know how much you care, and that's that idea of that's the, the only way that you can truly express care, love to share one another's burdens right, uh, to, uh, to weep with those who weep, to rejoice with those who rejoice, is one person at a time. It's that person-to-person -person interaction. And it's so it's so important to say that this is an idea that has changed a civilization before. And in this time of loneliness, in this time of isolation, and in this time of living so much of our lives in a, a digital world, that 
that call to go from person to person to show care, love, in a personable hands and feet of Christ way is such an important thing to remember. Yeah, that, it's so true. And it, you know, it's, it's a bit of a risk, right. To put yourself out there sure. and, and this, but this is the thing, you know, um, the early Christians converted the empire because they were willing to risk, even risk everything. I mean, they, obviously the martyrs gave their lives, but, but all of the, the Christians understood that there was something, you know, bigger than life out there, eternal life. And, they were willing to risk their lives. They were willing to risk their livelihoods. They were willing to risk public humiliation. They were willing to risk getting sick uh, to care for the poor, uh, the, the sick. So they were they were willing to take all of these risks. And and the fact that the 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 pagan Romans saw that and that they they were willing to take these risks because they believed in something bigger than life. That also is what converted the empires, what, you know, brought people into the church. And so we, I think, sometimes are afraid to take some of these risks. But, you know, if we're going to be a countercultural church in the world, which we have to be, uh, it's there, there are going to be risks we have to take. That is so true. So you end the book then with this declaration that Christianity needs to save— civilization again. And you even give a Christian's to-do list for the 21st century, which was great. It really helps me in this doable podcast. It really helped me out. So if you could boil it down then for our listeners, what is the heart of this call to action, right? What is the conviction that Christians need to have to pursue, pursue this modern revolution that you are describing? Well, I think um, in in one sense, you know, we do have to accept the fact that the church is going to have to be countercultural going forward, right? But we don't have to be quiet about it. Uh, in other words, so one of the things that I think uh, is important is to speak up. And you know, there are a lot of people in our world, even some of them who even some who would call themselves Christians. There are a lot of people in our world, and you 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 know you you encounter them on social media a lot, um, who uh, you know I call them the smugs. They're smug about uh, their belief that you know everyone should agree with them. Most people do agree with them, and anyone who doesn't agree with them is somehow unenlightened or backward or or racist or whatever it is. And, and so, you know, my advice would be speak up and don't let the smugs get away with being smug about it. Don't <laughs> let them get away with the assumption that everybody agrees with them and anyone who doesn't should be quiet. Right. So when you see things on social media and you see people just sort of smugly saying, you know, things and and assuming that, you know, all the smart people obviously agree with them because, you know, if you don't, you're not smart. Well, speak up. Don't don't get defensive uh, or angry because then that looks like you're unsure of your own position. Be polite, be loving, um, but correct them when they think they, that everyone agrees with them and uh, speak up for the Christian position especially when it comes to, you know, matters of life. Mm. And, um, and, and then I would say also, you know, if you're so inclined, pester your government representatives, <laughs> uh, you know, become well known to them and even annoying to them, uh, you know, if you have to. So that'd be one thing that yeah. I would, that I would say. Oh, that's great. So, so what is, I should say, uh, I'll say it this way. Could you paint a picture for us of the risk if we, as Christians, don't pursue everything that we've been talking about? If we don't look at the way that Christianity has changed, or revolutionized, or saved a civilization in the past, and if we just kind of went forward just kind of doing nothing about, about where things are at the future or going to? Yeah, well, I think what's at stake, and I don't want to sound sort of, you know, uh, was it what's the chicken little, the sky is falling? <laughs> sure, yeah. Uh, but um, but I think what's at stake is that, that you know, if we don't speak up and push back on some of these things, mm -hmm. then there are going to be more laws enacted that that limit our religious freedoms. Mm -hmm. 
there are going to be more laws enacted that degrade the value of human life. Um, there are going to be more laws enacted that put our children at risk if we send them to public schools. And so, um, so, and not to mention the fact that, you know, depending on what your job is, right, you know, I mean, some of us are fortunate enough to have jobs where, you know, we can speak our mind on these things. Um, but, you know, depending on what your job is, you know, it, you can risk losing your job or, you know, things can be become just harder and harder to live as a Christian in the world. And, you know, we've already seen, um, you know, some, some of these crazy lawsuits that, that come sure. up accusing people of hate speech or whatever for, for living their faith, for practicing their beliefs. And, um, and I think in other countries, it's it's even farther down that path. And so, you know, what we're seeing right now, I think, is, you know, is what we might call a kind of soft persecution or a, or a cultural persecution, mm-hmm. um, which amounts to a kind of marginalization. But uh, I wouldn't be at all surprised to see, uh, you know, in our lifetime, if this goes farther, more sort of aggressive persecution against Christians um which again is already happening in other countries yeah and and the important point is everything that we were talking about through this episode is it starts with you it starts with your relationships it starts with the things it starts with the way that you um hold yourself with the way that you talk to people with the worldview that you hold and live out so um that's that's where it can start and then you gave other great points for people who, who want to take extra steps further beyond that. I would be remiss if I ended a conversation with you because we talked about this a little bit before we started recording, but you are currently working on a book uh, about the early church fathers called Praying uh, Through the Early Church Fathers. So could you talk with us a little bit before you go about, about the way that Christians today should think about and understand and process and, and, and consider the works of the early church fathers? Well, yeah, you know, I've spent my career studying the Church Fathers and the early church. I got into it uh, because it seemed to me that it would be important to understand how the earliest Christians, those closest in time to Jesus and the apostles, Mm -hmm. how they interpreted Scripture and how they practiced their faith and uh, how they understood Christian doctrine. So this is how I got into this. And... um, and so uh, I, I do think it's important for us. We can it, a lot of the documents written by the church fathers, and and there are some church mothers out there too. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of these documents are are available to us. Yeah. They're accessible. Many of them are online in English translations. Some of the English is a little old timey, but it's out there. You can read them, and you can see how uh, they practice their faith and and how they taught their people. And um, so I, you know, I. I ended up writing this book, reading scripture like the early church, mm-hmm. which talks about how the uh, the church fathers interpreted scripture, and then so I'm following it up now with praying like the early church, and uh, as we were talking about earlier, yeah. uh, I'm hoping to be done with it today, <laughs> sometime after our conversation. I'm hoping to actually be done with the manuscript and send it into the publisher. So we'll see. Well, I, I, as a sneak peek, then because we don't want to get your publisher upset. Well, what is one thing that you have learned about praying with the early church fathers that has just kind of maybe changed or shifted your understanding of prayer a little bit? Yeah, well, there were a lot of surprising things, actually. And, um, you know, one of the things is, I, you know, I came up in the evangelical world like a lot of people did. And, you know, with the sort of emphasis on having a a quiet time or a personal yep. devotion time. And one of the things that you realize when you study the early church is, that actually took time to develop. Mm-hmm. The idea of a, you know private prayer is not actually a thing in the very earliest days of the church because people didn't own their own Bibles. Well, of course, the the New Testament wasn't wasn't a book, yeah, you know, yet, and people didn't own their own books. You know, you had to be both able to read and wealthy to own a book, um, and then you know, eventually when they started doing that, 
personal prayer meant praying the Psalms. So you you had a Psalter and you prayed the Psalms. So a, another really surprising thing is, is that this idea of praying in our own words extemporaneously is really not a thing very much in the early church. Um, it's it's something that develops over time. And so I talk about that development and I talk about what that looks like um, and what what prayer and looked like in you know in the earliest centuries of the church and um it was really kind of eye-opening because like i said i didn't know when i started the research what i was going to find um but it's been a it's been a fun ride well that's awesome we can't wait for that book to come out and uh and as of this recording you were hoping to get the manuscript to the publisher so we're I'm praying for that right now, and people who are listening can say, hey, I really hope that that manuscript got done, <laughs> and I'm sure it's going to be great. <laughs> well, thanks. And so j- th- thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Again, the book is How Christianity Saved a Civilization and Must Do So Again. The link to the book is in the show notes as well as to Jim's other works, so I encourage you to check that out. Jim, thanks for your time. appreciate it. Absolutely. I'll come back anytime. It's been a great time. Thanks. Love it. <laughs> Now, let's look at some doables out of this episode. First, check out Jim's books, How Christianity Saved a Civilization and Must Do So Again, and Reading the Church Fathers. Both are available in the show notes. Second, take time to consider how you are letting your faith influence the way you live. Is your faith informing your decisions? your convictions, your opinions? Think about that this week. This has been a Doable Discipleship, a Saddleback Church podcast. We'll be back with you again next week. If you enjoyed this episode, consider giving us a rating or a review on iTunes. If you do, you'll help other people find us in the future. You can also listen to these episodes on YouTube. Just subscribe to the Saddleback Church YouTube channel for these conversations, plus lots of other video content. And if you are already listening to us on YouTube, subscribe to the Doable Discipleship podcast on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcasting app so you can listen in the car or wherever else you go. Don't forget to visit saddleback.com slash doable to check out all of our previous episodes and go to saddleback.com slash grow to find spiritual growth resources and view a calendar of upcoming events. Lastly, you can always get in touch with us by emailing maturity at saddleback.com. Send us your thoughts, send us your questions, your Bible questions, your life questions, whatever. Who knows? Your question might just inspire an upcoming episode. Thanks again for tuning in to Doable Discipleship. I'm Jason Whelan, and I hope you'll join us again next week.